Hello, my name is Quentin Inglet. I am the section leader in the bacterial endotoxins testing area here at Nelson Laboratories. Thank you for joining me uh, on this webinar when we will discuss new FDA expectations for endotoxin testing. Today we'll be talking about what is the bacterial endotoxin test, also known as BET, what are endotoxins, where does endotoxin come from, who uses BET, sampling requirements, sample preparation, test methods, and then finally some new expectations from FDA. So what is BET? BET is the bacterial endotoxin test. It utilizes a reagent that is derived from horseshoe crab blood. Previously, it was known as the limulus amoebicate lysate test. However, when the United States Pharmacopeia and the Japanese Pharmacopeia were harmonized, they changed it to the BET test because there is a different species of horseshoe crab that is used in Asia. Bacterial endotoxin is a component of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Endotoxin is considered a pyrogen because one of the things it can cause is a fever. This is also why BET is occasionally referred to as the pyrogen test. However, it should not be confused with the rabbit pyrogen test or material-mediated pyrogen test, as it's sometimes called. Endotoxin is not the only pyrogen, but it is the most significant in our industry. The three reasons that endotoxin is the most important is its potent toxicity when compared to other pyrogens. The next most potent pyrogen is the peptidoglycan from gram-positive bacteria, and it is something along the lines of 50,000 times less pyrogenic than endotoxin. Endotoxin is also a very stable molecule. It can resist almost all sterilization methods, uh, such as ethylene oxide or radiation. Um, typically, in order to remove endotoxin, it needs to be depyrogenated. The typical cycle is greater than 250 C for greater than 30 minutes. And as you can imagine, not many medical devices can take those temperatures. The third reason that endotoxin is so important in our industry is the likelihood of contaminating pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Gram-negative bacteria are common in the environment, therefore they can contribute endotoxin to these medical products. So, as, so typically, gram-negative bacteria grow in water or wet environments, so any uh, washing that can be used in the manufacturing process can be a source of endotoxin. It can also be present in the raw material or can be deposited uh, on the device during manufacturing or handling. BET testing is used for medical device manufacturers. It is typically done as a lot release test for any device that is in contact with the circulatory system, the lymphatic system, or cerebral spinal fluid. This test can be used to support a non-pyrogenic label claim. The pharmaceutical industry also uses endotoxin testing for injectable drug products and raw material. We can also use the BET test as an environmental monitor for water systems. The BET assay is one of the most sensitive tests in the world, and it can be used to detect the early formation of biofilms that could contaminate your water system. So sampling requirements. According to USP, 161 you should test a minimum of three and a maximum of 10 devices. Amy ST72 suggests 3% of the lot up to a maximum of 10. And if your lot size is less than 30, two samples can be submitted. For pharmaceutical products, uh, FDA requires a minimum of three samples be tested, and they recommend beginning, testing samples from the beginning, middle, and end of the production batch. There is no defined sampling criteria for raw, raw materials or in-process products. One thing to keep in mind is that with medical devices, typically we'll test the devices pooled, so that it is an average of the three to 10 devices, whereas pharmaceutical products are typically tested individually. Typical endotoxin limits are not more than 20 EUs per device. Uh, if the device just has blood or tissue contact, and if it, there is contact with cerebral spinal fluid, the limits are 2.15 EUs per device. Pharmaceutical products 
the limit is calculated based off the maximum dose that can be given in a one hour time period and a standard weight of a patient of 70 kilograms. The pyrogenic effect. So your body will react to an endotoxin exposure just as just like it would if you had an actual uh, bacterial infection. So it can have symptoms similar to sepsis. Uh, it can be fever, nausea, circulatory collapse, multiple organ failure, and even death. So it is very important that we keep endotoxin contamination out of our medical device, devices and pharmaceutical products. Devices are typically disassembled, disassembled and rinsed in LAL reagent water to obtain a sample extract. The minimum extraction time should be 15 minutes at 37 to 40 C or not less than one hour at controlled room temperature. For devices that are predominantly a fluid pathway, uh, the, the tubing is filled with endotoxin-free water that has been heated to 37 plus or minus one and held at controlled room temperature for not less than one hour. Powders are dissolved in an appropriate solvent and liquids can be diluted as needed to overcome interference. There are three different test methods. There's the gel clot technique, the kinetic turbinometric technique, and the kinetic chromogenic technique. The gel clot test was the first that was developed. Um, it does have some limitations. It's a qualitative test rather than a quantitative test. And it's relatively straightforward. You just mix equal parts of the lysate and the sample extract in a test tube and incubate at 37 plus or minus one for 60 plus or minus two minutes. And then you score the test by inverting the test tube 180 degrees. If, it's, if the clot forms, it's positive. If the clot breaks, it's negative. So some of the advantages are the equipment cost is quite low compared to the other test methods. It is considered the FDA's historical referee test and sample color does not interfere in the assay. The disadvantages would be that it has limited sensitivity. Inhibition enhancement testing required for validation is a separate assay and there is limited quantitation. It is also prone to hum human error as the analyst is inverting those test tubes. If they uh, jostle them or shake them, then they can uh, accidentally break the clot. This is an image of a positive gel clot test. Everything is ran in duplicate, so uh, that's why there are the two test tubes here. Kinetic testing, so it's a quantitative test method. You mix equal parts of sample and lysate in a 96 well microplate, and it is read with a incubating photospectrometer, uh, and the test will run until the lowest standard reacts. The software then compares the unknown reaction times of the sample to the known reaction times and endotoxin concentrations of the standard curve. So kinetic turbinometric testing measures a change in turbidity. As the sample, as the reaction takes place, the samples will go from clear to sort of a milky white color. Um, one of the disadvantages is that uh, samples that are inherently somewhat turbid can interfere with this test method. The chromogenic test method uses a lysate that has been chemically modified, so it changes from clear to yellow instead of clear to turbid, as was with the turbinometric technique. Yellow tinted samples may interfere with the chromogenic test method. So there are significant advantages of kinetic testing over the gel clot test method. It is a quantitative test rather than a qualitative test. It has a very sensitive assay down to 0 0.001 EUs per ml. And maybe the biggest advantage is that inhibition enhancement is performed with every assay in the form of positive product control. And finally, because it is such a sensitive test, if there is any interference detected in the assay, we can usually overcome that with dilution and obtain a valid result. The disadvantages are that um, deeply colored samples may not be able to be tested with this method, and the investment in a spectrometer and software is significantly more ex expensive than with the gel clot test. Here's an image of some equipment used for endotoxin testing. This is what the standard curve would look like. Um, you can see the reaction times of the different controls that were used. In this case, it was uh, five EUs per ml down to 0 0.005 EUs per ml. 
And this is just a slide that an employee of mine put together that indicates what a kinetic uh, test would look like. So you can see here on the left side of the screen uh, in row E that the strongest control has started reacting. And this is real time. Uh, we can actually see when samples are going to react and can uh, notify customers before we get an actual result. Endotoxin testing is often quite time dependent. So there are a few things that are changing in the industry. As of January 2016, FDA released the guidance document, Submission and Review of Sterility Information for Premarket Notification 510K Submissions for Devices Labeled as Sterile. And this document caught a lot of manufacturers off guard because even though it was for de devices labeled as sterile, it set a lot of new expectations for endotoxin testing. This was particularly impactful to implant manufacturers because historically implants were exempt from USP 161. However, FDA feels that there is uh, risk associated with that exemption and now is requiring endotoxin testing for implants. Um, in addition to devices that are in direct or indirect contact with the circulatory system, the lymphatic system or cere cerebral spinal fluid and devices that are labeled as non-pyrogenic. For 510K submissions, FDA now requires medical device manufacturers, including implant manufacturers, to uh, provide them with these four key points. A description of the test method used, a statement confirming that batch release testing will be conducted or a sampling plan, the endotoxin limit, and an explanation supporting that chosen limit. Most of this information is quite straightforward. However, committing to batch release testing can be very challenging uh, because of the cost of medical devices or the small lot size. This is particularly true for implant manufacturers um, where their lot sizes can be, uh, I've seen as little as one for custom made implants. Fortunately, FDA has been quite accepting of sampling plans rather than expecting manufacturers to conduct lot release testing. A few options for compliance would be selecting representative samples from the sterilization load rather than from the manufacturing lot. This is a great uh, way to reduce your sampling because fewer samples are required than testing off the manufacturing lot. There is less justification required and there is less risk to the end user because if an endotoxin failure occurred, the, the samples would most likely still be available to reprocess or or discard depending on the outcome of the investigation. Another option for compliance would be to select samples that were manufactured on a given time frame, such as week, month, or other log logical division. Uh, this requires even fewer samples for testing. However, it does require more justification as well as process controls, such as uh, regularly testing the water used in the manufacturing environment. And there is additional risk of a product recall because if there was a endotoxin failure samples would most likely be out in the field. Well, I hope you have found this presentation to be interesting. If you have any additional questions, please contact sales at nelsonlabs.com or you can email me directly. Thank you very much.